Check. Mic check. One, two. Yo, is this thing on or what? What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Platform Podcast. As always, I am your host, Dex. If you are watching on YouTube, make sure to go hit that subscribe button. If you're listening to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure you give us a follow. Leave any comments in there. Let me know who you want to see on upcoming shows, and definitely let me know what you think of the show. As always, these episodes are brought to you by Make It Now Media. They are a one-stop shop for all your graphic design needs. Hit them up, use the code THEPLATFORM, or send them an email and just mention the Platform Podcast. They will get you all taken care of, whether you need a new logo, new flyers for an upcoming event, EPKs, anything in the graphic design field, they got you covered. Now today on the show, I'm sitting down with a Nashville resident, good homie of mine, DJs all over the city. We're sitting down with one of the best in the city, Rod Yuri. How's it going, man? Good, man. How you doing? Good. Man, you can just nail that one take open. One I, take, one take, dicks. <laughs> You're like Hova over here. I'm like out of breath over here. Don't write anything <laughs> down. Just go straight to the mic and start yeah. spitting. I mean, 41 episodes in, you got to have it down. So <laughs> you nailed it. Yeah, appreciate it, man. It's good to have you here, man. Uh, glad to sit, be here. Back sitting on the couch solo this time. Nobody yeah. to talk over you. No Luna either. I know Luna must be. In bed with Maddie right now. Co-star is the MIA. And she she loved up on you last time. You were like the yeah. main one. Could have been because you were eating pizza, but... I mean, hey, It whatever. is what it is. I'll take it. Yeah. But yeah, man, I'm glad to have you on here. Um, you got some exciting news coming up that we're going to be talking about in a uh, in a future episode that we might possibly hint to on here. Might possibly. Uh, but yeah, we're going to get into a couple things of just everything that you've done so far in your career and... Uh, some of the things that you are doing, working a little bit more in like the corporate side of things, um, and then also dipping your hands into the, the club side of things, working with an agency, playing a lot of these bigger music festivals, touring with DJs in the past, playing with a team like the Tennessee Titans, and just a lot of the cool shit that yeah. you've done. So first, just get started and let the listeners, let the viewers know a little bit about Rod and where you're from and how long you've been in the game. Well, I was born in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, so 30 minutes outside of Nashville. So I've been in the area my whole life mm-hmm. and got into DJing back in my college days at MTSU when I was pledging fraternity. Okay. You know, I just was always been a music lover. So I had like just books and books of CDs even then. And one day they were just like, hey, can you can go put some music on. Like we're just hanging at the house. And I was like, yeah, the next thing you know, it became like, can you keep putting music on? Yeah. Then the fraternity actually bought like a terrible DJ setup, but. My first DJ setup was purchased by the fraternity. And, and that's started, just how you learned? Yeah. Like, so you just kind of got pushed into it. Yeah, and I was, if I had to go back and listen now, I'm sure it's absolutely horrible. Oh, yeah, I mean, everyone is. Because, yeah. like, I don't think I knew anything about mixing at the time. It was just basically mm-hmm. stop, start, fade in, fade out. Yeah. But I knew I had good music selection at the time because I could still keep the party going even without being technically good. Yeah. What then, did you actually go to school for? Uh, I started off in a entrepreneurship major. Okay. Then, uh, you know, that really came in handy now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess it would. You uh, DJs are yeah. entrepreneurs. You're, you're your own business. So I feel like you have to... You know, hindsight, maybe should have done recording industry or something, but... Yeah. Because MTSU, is they're, they're a good music program over there, too. Yeah, they're like, you know, the... Was it the discount version of Belmont? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe I should have fucking looked at them then, saved me some money. <laughs> I mean, that's where Take Heath went. That's true, yeah. And Chris Young. Yeah, I know when Take Heath was here for, uh, when he was here with Chase B. Yeah. He, like, talked about how he went went over there. Yeah, I think he's already got, like, a recording studio or something named after him there. Really? Yeah. I mean, I guess, yeah, because he's fucking you graduate everything so You got number one before you graduate, so I guess they put your name on something. Yeah, they kind of have to. I guess I played my first club slash bar when I was 20. Okay. So, so not even old enough to drink and got into the club playing. Not legally old enough to drink, <laughs> depending on what my ID said. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, played my first club when I was like 20, 21, somewhere in there. It was like 99. Okay. So that's how old I am. And then like, got approached by a new club that was opening in Murfreesboro, and they brought me on where I was the opener DJ, and that's where I actually learned how to mix. Because mm-hmm. I'd play the opening set, then I would stick around, run lights, and watch the headlining DJ, and he taught me how to properly mix songs together and this was on vinyl also yeah. so i had to switch over to vinyl learn the og way yeah what were you playing on when you were opening 
Like you were playing on vinyl? When yeah, you were, I was playing okay, opening, okay. opening. I thought you meant yeah, like vinyl. they were playing on vinyl after. Yeah. So to, you you had to like force yourself to play vinyl just because that's what yeah. the headliner was playing at yeah. those venues. Yeah. So then, then did you have to go out and buy equipment and learn on it? Or were you just like practicing every time you were there? Yeah, playing? after like a little while, I bought turntables for my personal use and kept those at home doing mm-hmm. so I could practice at home. Then I started doing like a lot of like other fraternity and sorority events in town. When I was starting... I was kind of always told like, oh, learn on turntables and then everything else will just be yeah. a little bit easier that way. Um, where now I feel like so many of these controllers are sort of turntable-ish or they have like moving platters or big enough platters where it basically is I mean, you so still platter. run in turntables anywhere anymore. Yeah. But like the controllers are basically just CDJs built into one piece now. So exactly. If you can play it on a controller, you can play on a CDJ and jump right in for the most part. It's just kind of muscle memory of like where buttons and cues are mm-hmm. on certain products. Because like I know tomorrow I've got three gigs and I think I'm playing on three different setups. Okay. So it's going to be like I'll get used to like playing on one. Like, all right, cue button's here, cue button's here, cue button's here. Then the next gig's going to be like, uh, cue button's here. It's like, so you got to. Always, takes, about, go always takes me about 30 minutes to like muscle memory to set back in yeah. on like. Because you get done playing a four-hour set where everything is here. And then, like, I would go through it switching from playing on, like, CDJ 3000s to then, like, a Rev 7 where the the tempo is in a different spot. Yeah, like, tomorrow I'll be on a a Rev 7. Then I'll just be on 2000s with a 900. Mm -hmm. And I'll be on 3000s with a S7. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like... So you're going cue points on the mixer... Q points on the CDJs yeah. and then back to Q points being on like a S7. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a little bit confusing. It I always, mean, always takes a couple songs, a couple minutes to, yeah. for my hands to start working properly. But I also, I also feel like that shows the importance of learning how to play on everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I always tell that to the younger guys that are starting off. Mm-hmm. It's like, because so many of them come in, it's like, hey, I need to play on my controller. It's like, no, you don't. Like, just jump into the fire. You have to learn to play on anything. Whatever venue you show up to, you never know what gear is going to be there. They can tell you they have something, but then you show up and it's something totally different. So mm-hmm. you got to be ready to play on whatever's in front of you. I think it was wild that like Murder Beats, when he came to Barstool, yeah. brought a controller with him. Yeah. I asked him, I'm like, you do this at every spot? He's like, yeah. I'm like, why? I was like, isn't that just a lot more work for you guys to just bring a controller? He's like, I don't know. I'm just like comfortable with it. I was like, all right. That's yeah, like last time I saw Just Blaze. He requested he had to ha- had to have the uh, was it the one thousand SRT controller mm-hmm. had to have it like I've seen him before play on just regular I think it was on turntables and probably nine hundred at the time I would totally assume that he would want to be on turntables he murdered that controller he yeah. did things with controller I've never seen before but that's why he's so comfortable on now he requested that and it's I'm, the best set I've ever seen him do I think of people like. Uh, like a spider attack or like a JS Spinoza or like puffy and like you watch videos of them and they have an S 11 or an S nine and it's yeah. all MIDI mapped where they have shortcuts oh, everywhere yeah. to the point that I've seen them like post videos and I forget if it was like puffy or, or JS Spinoza, but somebody was like, you're not actually mixing because he had stuff MIDI mapped yeah. to the point where it was like, he was be turning a knob and it would be like a cue point that yeah. he had set up and he had to like break it down in another video of like, yeah, the MIDI mapping they do in the intricate cue points for like the tone plays and everything else. It's fucking it's crazy. Blows my mind. Yeah. It's wild, but that's just how much you can do with all that kind yeah. of stuff. Cause now I literally, I play on basically one setup the whole time. It's just either an a nine or, or a 900. Um, and then three thousands. Yeah. So still, it's like, still remember when Serato first came out and, club i was working at we had dj scribble coming in mm-hmm. and a throttle box was on his rider so we had to buy one and i got to inherit it after he was gone because nobody else knew what to do with it so i instantly switched over like digitized all my vinyl and yeah moved all my like cds onto my laptop at the time and never looked back plugging in a serato box used to be like fucking... i was like diffusing a bomb yeah <laughs> that's had, a like, perfect way to put it rcas going to it like <laughs> like you had RCA going in, RCA out to the mixer, RCA yep. in out. Like you had for every in you had now, then yeah, 
It was insane. And, and like, you, had you had to have like the channels hooked up, right? Especially yeah. like going through like Serato or Scratch Live. Like if you were on channel one or two versus like three and four, it would boot you off. Yeah. So like then if people plugged in and they went to switch on and they were on the wrong one. Then like when they start putting like the little dip switches on there mm -hmm. for going between, was it? CD line CD, and, yeah, and vinyl. Vinyl. Like, yeah. You got to like double check all that. Then you got to double check and make sure every RCA is in properly yeah. clear coded. There were so many people that just like didn't know how to hook it up um, at one of the clubs that I was a resident at when we like started where I was just like the guy that fucking hooked everything up. That's why it was a dirty little secret like when GR was still running things over there. Like we had a couple of town guys who still had like SL3s on the rider. Mm -hmm. I guess for like just oh crap And then it's just of, one. Yeah. So you can't GR have was always like, DJs. I'm going to book you every time we have an out of town because you're <laughs> the only person who knows how to like hook this stuff up. Just so you can be the tech guy for yeah, it. Just, yeah. I get there first. Like, all right, everything's working. You're good to go. I was mad because I, I missed the boat on selling mine. Yeah. So I still have an SL4. I have an SL1 at the house. See, and now it's like no one's ever going to buy it because everything now has club kit or DVS. Yeah. Like you don't need them anymore. And I was cleaning out my garage yesterday being an adult. <laughs> and I opened up this road case I had that I was about to throw in the trash. Still has CDJ 1000s in it with, uh, what's the little... Dicers? Uh, Dicers oh. attached to them. See, Dicers were fucking awesome, too. Yeah, and I sent, instantly sent a video to Darren because I know he's been buying old gear. I was yeah, like, yeah. I know you want this. Yeah. You're like the one person I can convince yeah. to buy this, yeah. I'll just but trade some free flyers for it. I was holding on to it for so long, and you could sell those for like... People were buying them for like four or 500 bucks. Yeah, I looked on eBay. They're still like... The cheapest one's still like... 250 and then it's like even like 500 bucks for just a regular see i might have to go on and sell mine then i just put it on like instagram and facebook and none of the ones i saw on ebay had dicers attached yeah mine came with dicers yeah. there you go there you go talk about some of the stuff that you do in personal life you're a big collector of things aside from dicers and uh yeah. and old cdjs that might be sitting in your garage you're a big shoe guy yeah uh, i saw darren post when he was at your house and you had fucking cause everywhere how many pairs of shoes do you have uh, I'm over 300 right now. Okay. You you wear them all or are some of them just put up like you haven't touched them yet? I wear them all. Okay. Like I'll check the weather first before I wear certain pairs and yeah. see where I'm going first. But yeah, I wear them all. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of guys that they buy them and then they just sit on the shelf just so they like have them, even if they're not yeah, going to plan on buy a pair of shoes, uh, buy them to wear. Okay. What's your favorite pair? Uh, Black Cement 3 Jordans. Okay. Just because that was my very first pair of Jordans when I was in fourth grade. So it's kind of held a little place in my heart. Yeah. It's just too hard to get shoes right now. Yeah. I feel like in the since the time that I've been like a little bit more interested in shoes, I've probably hit on drops twice in the last four years. Yeah. It's like you take so many L's. Yeah. How long after getting started DJing did you start getting into the bigger events and everything, like playing with the Titans, playing with rascal flats going on tour with them all that kind of stuff titans and rascal flats both thanks to dj silver okay passing me along and recommending me for both those gigs well how did you get connected with him he came to a he did a guest spot at a club i was working at in knoxville at the time the place was called drink knoxville they had locations in chattanooga and then also murfreesboro at the time so that's how i knew him and like we just hit it off and somehow before Silver moved to Nashville, he was sleeping on my couch back in the day. Okay. So he always likes to tell that story. But yeah, like we just hit it off and I think he was originally booked to do flats, but he had also done Aldean the year before and was kind of up in the air if he was going back out. I think that's how it worked out. Mm -hmm. So he did like opening weekend with flats and then I guess Jason called him back and he decided to go back out with Jason. Yeah. And he was like, hey, you want to jump on the flats tour? So I was like... Yeah, sure. Why not? Let's go do this. That was the Flats Fest tour. I want to say that was 2011. Yeah, which is probably when they were so fucking popular. I mean, we were playing too. sheds all over the U.S. and selling out. Yeah. So it was like twenty to 30,000 people at each stop. That and is that was crazy. Like the height of Rascal Flats. I mean, what's that like playing a tour like that and then just everything that you're having to prepare? It's playing in between each act and... Sir Evans was out with us and Justin Moore. Suds in a bucket? Suds in a bucket. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think Eastern Corbin was on that tour also. So I was playing each changeover. Okay. Then I would play, you know, before Flats went on, I would play right up until the last minute. Mm -hmm. And they would just go black and come out. But yeah, you're playing a lot of, like the early sets were more country lined. 
of what I was playing. Then before flats, it was mainly just sing along top 40 stuff to get the crowd hype. And what were you playing outside of the tour at the time? Were you playing a lot of clubs or just bars or what? Uh, this is a time when Nashville, before Nashville was the coolest spot to be. And there's only one club really in Nashville, but I had a residency there. Yeah. Funny story. I had a tour date. We couldn't find anybody to uh, cover for me. Speaking of that video you sent earlier to me yeah. and Darren, I pre-recorded a five-hour club set, and we left our bar back in the DJ booth to act like he was DJing. For the whole set? For the whole night on a Saturday night. And nobody knew? Nobody knew. And like I, I was on the bus after the gig getting texts like, hey, we got a request for this song. We got a request for this song. I was like, it's in there. It's coming up. I bet that bar back had the fucking time of his life. He's a DJ now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's so crazy. I wonder if he would have been but, like I mean, making If tips that would happen right? now, like there's a hundred people in Nashville you can call to like cover your shift. Yeah. Back 100%. then there, there weren't many of us and like nobody that was going to, a club owner is not going to just like throw some random person in on a yeah. Saturday. He's like, I'd rather you just record a whole set and you know what this club is. It's your spot. Yeah. And just roll with it. Maybe I was the first Tiger Nuts. Could have been. Could have been. That was you for except a, a five call, hour callback right there. Yeah. Damn. A five hour long mix too is is crazy. I uh, wish I could find that. Yeah. It's gotta be. I've gotta have it on some old old hard drive somewhere. I wish that would be something that would have been like recorded to see how he was in the yeah. booth. Knowing him now and the way he DJs, he had to act a fool. Yeah. Because he was super hyper. Okay. Just a very like energetic person. Yeah. Is he very like uh I don't know, just like active and everything with like how he would how he would act in the booth, like moving, jumping, all yeah, that like kind he, of shit. He would definitely climb like when he was just hanging out, he would climb up on the booth. Okay. Yeah. So you know for sure when he was acting like he was DJing, he was probably oh, on yeah. the booth. He was the life of the party in that room. Yeah. That's so awesome. Because yeah, we were just talking earlier. Um this guy for, yeah, I think it was like the Maple Leafs. I, I mm -hmm. forgot even what it was. But basically what was going viral is this guy who said he DJs for the Maple Leafs and he fakes his sets. Like he doesn't actually DJ. And he said it was like too difficult to be lifted while still playing turntables and stuff. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of people just tearing him apart. In and I, I know for a fact that there's a, another NHL franchise when mm -hmm. they have guest DJs in that they make them pre-record their set and they just put them there. Which that is so surprising to me because obviously I know from NBA DJs and stuff like that, they're playing in the arena. Yeah. Um, now it's playing the Titans games. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then for an NHL game, I mean, I don't really know how you would do it with a pre-recorded set because there's, there are so many stoppages. Yeah that I feel like it would you would have to just have songs queued up and not just like a mix of, of a pre-recorded thing. I guess that would be for one of the like uh, breaks. Yeah. yeah, like the intermissions. And yeah. ha uh, not halftime, the intermissions for it. But even still, that's crazy to me. And I, I, I don't even think I'd like want to do it if I couldn't actually do it. Yeah, I don't know if it's also like maybe a quality control and making sure nothing for a guest DJ gets played that's not supposed to be played yeah. inside of an arena possibly. But even then you could just... Have them send over like a set list or know, anything. Yeah, that, sign or off like on a do or not, not playlist. Or just don't book people that you think are going to play things that aren't appropriate for the arena. Because we definitely got do not play list with Titans. Mm -hmm. That was one of the biggest headaches of doing those games. Like one week, really just been if the team's winning, everything's going. Team loses, changes have to be made everywhere. Okay. Really? Even yeah. on the music side of things? Yes. How much influence do like the players have on what you're playing? A lot. Okay. But basically, uh, so I'd play pregame during warm-ups, mm -hmm. and then I would play uh, songs on defense, and sometimes like quarter and halftime breaks, just little sets right there. Yeah. Then another guy in the stadium took offense and handled all the commercial stuff. Okay. But like players would request songs for pregame. They didn't have much. They didn't have much say at the time on in-game music, but they definitely wanted what they wanted for pregame while they're yeah. out there warming up and getting ready for the game. Yeah, that's always what I wondered is for that aspect in particular yeah. because I feel like that pregame set is much more for the players than for the crowd. One hundred percent. Yeah, because like as soon as we got done, 
like as soon as the Titans would go back off the field to go back to the locker room, totally change the vibe up and mm-hmm. go more top 40 and rock. Of just playing for the people that yeah. are getting into the stadium. and 100%. Yeah, it was which, a total just 180 shift on the vibe. I feel like it, you walk into arenas now, and especially like NFL, it's like you're hearing a lot of hip-hop and stuff, and then it's like in the middle of the game. It was it funny. Was it was like completely different. all hip-hop except when the offensive lineman came out, and then it was like, I think. Like rock. And it was like Taylor Juan wanted to hear like Eric Church Outsiders. I think they wanted yeah. that to be the theme song for the offensive line that year. That's funny. It's like you just hear almost like turntable screech to a halt <laughs> as soon as you switched over to Eric Church all straight from like Meek Mill I think that was right when Dreams and Nightmares came out okay and I think that was Chris Johnson's song that he wanted yeah okay so it's like you're going from like a Meek Mill straight to Eric Church it's like skirt where the people in the in the crowd are probably like, what the hell like what is that but then like I feel like the players know like nope all yeah. lines here. Yeah, good thing during warm ups. There's not many people in the stadium yet, mm-hmm. so you can just kind of just slam in the next track. Yeah, and just kind of go with the flow for yeah. whatever. How long did you DJ for them? Did five seasons. Okay. And then the first se- the first season, me and Silver split games. Yeah. And then the next season came along, and he couldn't do it, so I just took it from there. Okay. What made you like stop DJing for them? Uh, I attempted to move to Vegas in 2018. Yeah. And uh. So that year, I was in Vegas for six months during football season. So I just made like some pre-recorded mixes for like walk-in music. Yeah. And then also that same year, the guy who brought me on, he left the team. So like the next year. It was a totally new guy that didn't know It was a totally you. new guy and he was going to bring me back, but he didn't realize I was actually DJing for like pregame and stuff. He thought I was just like handling like commercial breaks, kind of the in-game stuff. Yeah. And he wanted me to switch off with that guy, like rotating games. I was like, well, I'm not going to take work from that guy. Yeah. And that's also not really what I want to do. So we just kind of parted ways then because they went for two seasons without having an, an in-game DJ. Okay. And then, like, were you legitimately just playing DJ or were you on like the mic at all doing any like the I had a mic stuff? for pregame. Okay. Yeah. And what did they have you doing? Is it like making announcements and stuff or are you just hyping up the crowd? I was just hyping the crowd up, you okay. know. Titans fans, let's yeah. make some noise, make some noise you know, yeah. general general DJ hypeness stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's always the good stuff. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like, we were just talking with Rascal Flats and just being on the tour with them. Um, how long were you on tour with them? Just one year. Just a sing- okay, the yeah, single year. Yeah, just a year. single tour. And it was mainly, like, outdoor, like, amphitheaters yeah, and stuff amphitheaters. like that? Yeah, I think okay. we did, like, 30 dates. Damn. I yeah. mean, that's still a lot of dates. Yeah, it was basically... Weekend Warrior schedule, so Thursday, Thursday Friday, Saturday, and then yeah, come back occasional Sunday. Sunday show, yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's still a lot to do, and then especially if you're missing out on gigs where you're having to send them mixes, <laughs> yeah. for somebody to take over too. How do you think that that affected like your DJ career? Now, do you think that being on tour with a group that's as popular as them helps you and like your resume when you are booking? Oh, absolutely. Gigs in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Especially things in that genre, especially when I've done like country festivals or Mm -hmm. like some other events with country artists, like they know I have the experience and they don't have to worry about me doing what they don't want played or whatever. Yeah. They know that you're going to fit the format stylistically. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that would be like probably one of the biggest things that is beneficial, especially with the amount of country festivals that are, that there are now and that are probably going to get bigger now with just like the way that country music is um where then i feel like you kind of yeah, already con- have your country music basically just top 40 now yeah i agree there's so much of it and then even just getting stuff over into to cross over into other genres too where you're having hip-hop artists hop on country songs and then having country go into edm yeah. and making that whole edm scene of things where it's it's getting into a lot of other pockets of music. Like if you were to say five years ago that you were going to hear country music at EDC or. Yeah. That was a shocker. Yeah. Like to just hear Diplo dropping country tracks or like now loud luxury or whoever else chain smokers is playing Shibuzi. Like it's, it's crazy to think about. Yeah. I think it was a Kalika co-owner of a blackout. Mm -hmm. She, she reposted one of her like tweets or posts from like 2018. And I think she was like, country music, country music is going to be in the clubs. 
and she reposted that yesterday. He's like kind of taking a victory lap. It's like <laughs> I called this like because yeah, I think she was uh, and obviously like stagecoach Diplo has his whole entire honky tonk. It's almost like stagecoach was becoming Coachella because mm-hmm. like he had marshmallow there. Yeah, chain smokers. Then he has like Vavo there. Yeah, James Kennedy there. I'm trying to think of like what other DJs he all had there. I think Brandy Cyrus. Brandy was Cyrus there was too. on the stage. Yeah. So I mean they they're getting a lot of not country yeah. DJs playing stagecoach now. So it's it's definitely something that's growing where it's getting into. And I feel more like half of a, Nashville was out there last weekend based on yeah, my Instagram stories. A hundred percent, yeah. And then obviously, yeah, you have all the other artists that are just out there just to perform yeah. on their own too. But then even artists that are switching over, like I've Pulse Malone is about to drop his album. He's doing a lot of country stuff. And then there's this I feel like a lot of art, other artists right now that are just going into country just because it's the thing, even though like they're definitely not country artists. Yeah. Like I saw like Young Gravy oh, was yeah. doing country and I'm like, what the fuck? Like, how is this working? Um, it's just marketing and whatever their, their label is telling them or A&R and is A&R telling them. A&R is just them. like, hey, let's, uh, let's put a little twang on this one. Yeah, exactly. So, but... Yeah, I mean, what are you all playing right now in clubs? I mean, where where are you playing right now? I'm at uh, Friends of Low Places. Mm-hmm. New uh, Garth Brooks spot on, right on Broadway. Uh, got some random dates at Whiskey Row. I've had some random dates with over at Barstool with your crew. Yep. And I've got the, still got the, it's that hotel rooftop pool season kicking off. So got a Harriet's rooftop at one hotel and Virgin yep. Pool. Yeah, Harriet's is awesome. Maddie loves that fucking place too, just because the rooftop is so nice. Their drink menu is insane. Yeah, just the the entire venue is awesome. I mean, yeah. obviously, just like one hotel, but then once you get up to the rooftop, the setup of everything, like I could just go in there and just look at all like their plants and shit. Yeah, every time I post a video from there, somebody comments about one of the plants. Yeah, like, do you realize what that is? I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I do not. You're like, no, I can take a picture of it with my phone and it'll tell me what it is. Then. Yeah. And the amount of people that walk by and just start touching one of the plants be like, oh my God, it's real. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, everything up here is real. Yeah. But it's a dope vibe. And the way that they book everything too, where they're they're bringing in um, some of the bigger DJs too. Yeah. Last Saturday we did the day party with Tay James and Chantel Jeffries. Yep. Which I feel like they're there like once a month now. They've been here Tay, so much. Tay's doing, Tay is the day is party the, yeah. brand. So he's doing uh, once a month. And he just goes around to all the other different one hotels. Yeah. 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 But then he just brings a guest and he's just had Chantel a lot, I feel like. He's had Chantel twice now. Okay. I know he had uh, Brandy Cyrus one time and then I can't remember who the other guests were last year. Yeah. But that's dope too to just to think of like the corporate side of things. And I don't know if that's what they do in all their other cities, but I feel like here in Nashville, the hotel scene where in other cities you would think of as like more corporate, not a place where you're going to be like throwing parties yeah. here. Those, those are parties. Like, yeah. Well, the night before the day party with Tay and Chantel, Wookie played there on the rooftop, which is, you would not ever think like, Oh, I'm going to go to a rooftop at a hotel and see Wookie. Yeah. You would never think that. I know they had to dial back the, the PA that they were bringing in cause they were getting noise complaints. Okay. From like a couple of shows they did last summer. From like people in the hotel or from? People in the hotel and then also the hotel directly across the street. Yeah. Because it was on the rooftop. and they Yeah. Get, Sounds going to go yeah. travel super easily so to the them. JW Marriott across the street was like, hey, can you turn that down? Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you think you like playing like the hotel vibes more than like bars and clubs right now or, or just kind I of? I like both? that my schedule allows me to not play the same thing everywhere. Like I can do the Broadway gig, then I can go do the rooftop and just vibe out mm-hmm. or do like a little disco house set, you know? Yeah. Then like occasionally do like a throwback set somewhere. So I like being able to mix it up. So I just don't get bored playing the same thing every night. Yeah. Cause that's where I feel like it could burn you out a lot. Oh, in absolutely. The bar and club scene, especially here where it's like you could potentially it's almost, be, it's almost with- rinse and repeat. Yeah, exactly. Cause we see a different crowd every weekend. Mm hmm. You could literally go in and play the same songs every week in the same order. Nobody would know except the bartenders eventually would get really pissed off at you. And even still, like I don't even know if they would know because they're so fucking yeah, busy. They're too. too busy to notice. Like, yeah. But that is what's cool is then obviously those those hotel vibes are a completely different vibe. Like when I was playing the like the Hyatt pool and like W and stuff last year, 
I fucking loved playing those sets yeah. because it was just something different where you could dig into music more and find just like dope house edits. Yeah, I know my vibe. Like every week when I'm going through new music and downloading, I download predominantly stuff for those events mm -hmm. for like the vibe gigs I get. But they're also probably the least amount of gigs I play. Yeah. But that's where all my music's coming from nowadays. It's just to add for those yeah. sets. Yeah. It's cool to just see like the different kind of music that you can add. And then obviously in your own brain, you're just adding more music to your, your library that you know too, where it's like maybe you can somehow figure out how to work it into something else. Or it could be something that you might think of making an edit for or a remix for or something like that. I think the best compliment you can get from those gigs is when somebody comes up and be like, I don't feel like I'm in Nashville. It's like, thank you. Yeah. It's like I did, I did my job. Yeah. Damn, that's a good one. I would not ever like think about that. But yeah, if they're so used to just hearing the, the same things yeah. that we're talking about, where it's like if you go to Broadway every night and you're listening to that same kind of thing and then being able to get away from that even for just a couple hours and get a different vibe um, is always nice. And then having pools attached to it is never yeah, a bad Yeah, that's thing always a too. plus. Yeah. yeah, I feel like the daytime rooftop stuff is one vibe. Then you kind of do like the nighttime rooftop stuff always is mm -hmm. like – this is for the either the older crowd. This is like their last stop. They don't want to go deal with Broadway, or it's the pregame pregame spot before for you go to, Broadway. go to Broadway. Yeah. So you get the two different demographics up there. It's like yeah. you got the people who are coming in just starting their night off, then you got the people who are winding down for the night. That's how I would think of like twelve thirty club a lot of times. Yeah. Um, doing that like eight to one set. Yeah. Where the demographic of that room is so different, where you have. You'll see it switch throughout the night too. Yeah. Where you'll have a 60 year old couple and then you have the 21 year old birthday girls too. So it's like you have to play to play. I think one of the last times I came to see you there, there was just some old, yeah, like line. 60 year old guy out there just oh, yeah. dancing by himself and was like just vibing. And we had that line dance to that uh, Jerusalem. Yeah, to Jerusalem. Yeah. Just out of nowhere. A song that none of us ever heard of, but somehow everybody else there knew it. Yeah. I got a request for it, and we're all like, what the fuck is that? And it was me, you, and Darren just sitting there, and we're like, we're like I don't know. And I listened to it, and I was like, sounds dope. Yeah. Played it, and literally like 20 people. Busted out a synchronized dance to it. Yeah. And I, I thought we were in fucking high school musical day. or something. Yeah, so. I instantly just put it in my notes. I was like, download this tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you had the video, too. Where yeah. I was like, all right, cool. Then I got to, I got to post the video from everything, too. Yeah. So. Some of the artists that you've played with so far, like in your career, I mean, obviously, we talked about Rascal Flats. We talked about playing with teams like the Titans. But you've worked with a bunch of different artists, too, from a Post Malone to a Luke Bryan to a Morgan Wallen to then getting into like the hip-hop side of things where you played with legends like Jazzy Jeff West love yeah. like all these different artists just talk a little bit about what that's like being in the room and being able to to kind of play support for these artists and meet these artists and all that kind of stuff you know it's back for Nashville is what it is now and like these artists would come to town and we only had one or two clubs at the time I was the resident so mm -hmm. always was tasked with opening so I got to open for the quest love or Jazzy Jeff and at the same time we bring in it was at the height of EDM at the time, and we'd bring in a Cascade or Afrojack. Yeah. Then I have to switch up and open for them. Yeah. So it's like good to be versatile and have a little knowledge of all genres of music. Yeah, and that's what we were touching on a little bit earlier. True, true open format. Exactly. And just how much that helps you as a DJ because not only are you having to play those sets, but you're also going to be diving into music from yeah, all of those 100%. sets just to prep for it. And it's got to help you so much as an open format DJ uh, to be versatile and just be ready for I'm all those up, shows. Showing to play one is a life in color slash day glow. Mm -hmm. The touring paint party they used to do. Yeah. Like I show up to play. I think that one was with uh, maybe Rehab and Richard Vision or something. And like I show up. Communicating with the team beforehand, I was like, I'm going to be on Serato. Everything's, everything's like, cool, get there. They're like, yeah, you can't use a Serato box. We're not like hooking up to extra wiring. And because I was like, rehab and all of them are going to be on sticks. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I wasn't using record box or anything at the time. So I literally just had to like throw some, I just threw my folder that I had prepared for that day onto the thumb drive and just started just scrolling through. I was like, well, here we go. 
it's now or never. Yeah, but then if you just throw it on there too, like none of it's cue point. Yeah, none of it's cue point, yeah. none of it's analyzed. It's just, it's you're just basically there. just working out of a folder, like a data folder for the most part. How fucking hard was that? It was probably the worst gig of my life. Okay. How long was the set? An hour. So just an hour of fucking misery and yeah. stress. <laughs> Me literally playing just the length of every track, trying to get the next track ready. Yeah. Because that was the first time I'd ever used a thumb drive. It was just like, hey, there's like 5,000 people right here. Go figure it out. And I bet ever since then, you always have a, a stick. Oh, crap. I always keep a stick back up in case laptop crashes or something. Yeah. Always keep a backup going. Yeah, that's a, that's good advice for any of the younger DJs is... One, learn how to fucking program all that. Yeah. And then just two, just have it all ready. Because there's so many people that, I mean, even just like switch over, any kind of stuff like that, they just like might not know how to do it. I was doing one of the pool parties last year on a controller, so there wasn't a stick option. But Mm -hmm. my laptop started overheating. Oh, man. I pulled out the aux cord and started, I plugged in my phone. Yeah. And grabbed one of my mixes off Dropbox and threw it on real quick while I was trying to deal with my laptop overheating. Wait, did your laptop like show a warning before it shut off? Or no, nah, I just started like you could hear, you start hearing the fans the, and everything kicking. We started hearing the, like the, the track started glitching. Okay, and like it takes like half a second of hearing that noise come through, and you instantly know what it is. Yeah, it's like crap. I've got four or five minutes maybe for this thing just completely shuts off. Yeah, and I'm like just start digging through my bags. Like I know I got an aux cord in here. Plug in my phone, throwing a mix off my Dropbox real quick. Yeah. And just See, look at you, prepared. Prepared for everything, man. Yeah, but. try to be. It's like a Boy Scout over here. <laughs> the Swiss Army knife, yeah. just staying ready. Yeah, we were going to talk about it just a little bit of, uh, of a little hint, and especially now that Darren's here hanging out off the camera, but you guys just started a new little oh. venture. A little, a little side little, project. Yeah. Of kind of making some uh, edits and mashups. Mm-hmm. Projects uh, were called Broadway. Yeah. Kind of no vowels. No vowels. Sometimes why? <laughs> but uh, that is true. A yeah. And then it's just kind of knowing songs that we play at our gigs on Broadway. Mm-hmm. It was like maybe they needed like a little twist to them that to make them work better for our sets. Mm-hmm. Like I'm sure we'll mention it later, but they're not made for everywhere. They're made for our gigs. Yeah. And if they can help other people out, you know, great. And how's it been going so far? I mean, I know I've listened to the first couple that you guys have dropped, and they've are songs that are going to work yeah. in this environment for sure. Yeah, like we're getting good feedback. People are playing them out. Mm-hmm. Other DJs are downloading them and playing them out. And like before we post them, we're playing them out on Broadway and checking to make sure they work. Yeah. And I just kind of blindly throw something up there and be like, hey, hope this works. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll try it out for a few weeks before we post it. Yeah. So I feel like especially with Country too, there isn't a lot of, of edits and remixes or even just like an intro edit for them yeah because of record labels with country or whatever else it's going to be where they just don't make them so i do think that that is an area in the dj world that will be really beneficial especially here in nashville for sure and like some of the edits are a little too heavy on edm size Mm -hmm. for some of the early stuff on broadway so it's like Maybe a little lighter, maybe a disco edit or something. Yeah. Just kind of freshen up some of the older tracks. But then some that's still familiar yeah. to the general public that's going to be kind of hanging out. So you've been on the platform mix before, and I don't want to get you hyped up or anything, but Maddie has said that your mix on the platform is one of her favorite mixes on the platform of all time. Yeah, when you told me that, when I first submitted the mix, that yeah. was the, I was like, all right, I nailed it. Like, I don't care if it doesn't get any <laughs> other listens. As long as Maddie says it's one of her favorites. Because she typically listens to them every week, like when she's at the gym. Yeah. And sometimes she'll listen to them and she'll be like, I don't like this. And she's always like very brutally honest with me about it. So when she says it, I'm like, all right, cool. I know that she's Hi, she's telling the truth. Um, so yeah, that's a that's, that's one of the few times that she's like said that it's her favorite one. I was like, Yeah, I wanted to make sure I didn't right. do just like a just an hour straight of like 128. I wanted to, you know, mix it up. Mm-hmm. And that's what she likes too, where she, I mean, she definitely has a particular taste. Like she doesn't like super trappy edits yeah. and fucking dubstep and shit like that. Like she'll turn it off right away. No so. dubstep ever. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's how she is. So. For you right now, what are your top three favorite tracks? Whether you're playing them out in the club, in the bar, or just some that you're liking while you're driving around. Well, let's kind of do it a little different. I'll do like a couple of my top tracks from broadway type events and yeah 
my vibey gigs. And that'll fit, yeah. One of my favorite tracks to play out right now is actually you and Darren's remix of Stick Season. Yeah. It goes love off it. every single time. I love it. Let's yeah. Go. <laughs> Not to stroke your ego. Yes. But yeah, it works every time I play it. We've gotten such good feedback from it. Darren really did all the work. I just am um, the idea man. But Sounds like Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> But no, we've gotten really, really good feedback from a lot of people. And then just from when I've played it out or been out while other DJs have played it out, which is awesome to hear, like, other DJs Yeah, play. like, I've tried to play, like, a couple different versions of mm-hmm. it. And, like, y'all's always works the best by far. Yeah. It's crazy because it's, it, it's, it's nice because it is the familiar melody of Snow Patrol and Chasing And cars. I love the reaction of, like, you first hear the, the piano of Snow Patrol – and everybody's like, has a reaction to that. Then yeah. all of a sudden you hear Noah Khan coming and you see a total different reaction. And you and see people start singing it right all away. All the girls just start singing instantly. Yeah, it's awesome. It's cool to hear and cool to see being played out. What else you got? Then, uh, so I kind of switched to rooftop mode here. And mm-hmm. like, I've been listening to uh, Jungle. Okay. Uh, Discover this guy, La Felix. Yeah. Saw him on one of the record polls last week. A lot of dope, vibey, funky stuff. Then also went down a rabbit hole on TikTok with the other day when I saw this disco rap. Disco rap. Yeah. Okay. And this uh, group called Bungalow Cartel. Okay. And like download their track that was on TikTok and I played it out last weekend at the day party. I was like, this is a vibe. It's like, you know, just kind of 115, funky, kind of Anderson Pocky, that kind of sound. And it played out pretty, pretty oh, yeah. well. It was great. Yeah. That's dope. Well, I'm going to give you uh, a couple here. This is going to be my new heat or delete. So we're going to play three songs for you here, and then you got to tell me whether you think that these are songs that are heat or if these are songs that you're just going to end up having to delete right away. So the first one here, we're in the midst of a rap battle between Drake, Kendrick, J. Cole, Rick Ross, The Weeknd, Chris Brown, fucking everybody's <laughs> fighting right now in hip-hop. Uh, but one of the newer ones is going to be Drake's push ups, so that's going to be here. I mean, it's heat, but I'm never going to play it out. You haven't played it out yet? No. Okay. And you probably just, never will. Just because you don't play like a lot of hip hop, or just because it's the, the vibe of the song? The vibe of the song. Yeah. Like, the beat's even dope, yeah. but like the way he's rapping over, it's like the vibe is not something I'm going to play out. I've had so many people like request it already. Really? I haven't had one yet. And then like vice versa, like requests like Kendrick yeah. and Future like that. And then now even. The like that beat is insane. It's so good. Yeah. That Rodney O sample. Yeah. I mean, he told Metro to shut up and make some drums and. He, he did. And he the first made, time I heard that when I was in my car, that beat came on. I just had instant stank face. Yeah. Uh, and then I was like, just, I don't know what they're going to rap about this, but this beat has me. Mm-hmm. And then he makes a number one hit. So, But then now, recently, uh, Kendrick just came back with Euphoria. Um, so that one is here. Somebody had told me that you got a ring. Oh, God, I'm ready to double the wage. I'd rather do that than let a Canadian nigga make pack turn in his grave. Yeah, I listened to this as soon as it came out. Yeah. Also heat, but also something I'm not going to play out. See, and I feel the same way. But also too, feel like, like Kendrick's that. winning. Yeah, I'm, that's I'm what you're saying. I'm team Kendrick right now. Okay, but yeah, I always like to throw for these new heat and delete. I always like to put like two like originals that people can find on like an Apple and a Spotify, yeah. um, and then I always like to throw in one that's like an editor remix yeah. that you would be able to find on like a DJ record pool, something like that. So the one I'm putting in here this week is actually my buddy Kaz has sent it to me. That's not out yet. But I got the okay. I'm sure it's going to be good because I already played several of Case's edits. Yes. And he just made a new edit for Shibuzi, Tipsy. It's a fucking awesome edit for it. And I played it out the other weekend and it plays out very, very well too. And I think that this will be one that you guys will like as far as what you guys are working on too, where it could give you like a new idea yeah. of where to go with that too. So this is Case's edit of Shibuzi Tipsy. What's that, Pompeii behind it? 
Mm-hmm. Castile Pompey. Where's Maddie at? Get the yeah, get the hand flick. Yeah, going back up tempo. Oh yeah, that's heat. So good. That that's probably gonna be my go-to uh, version when I'm doing the up tempo set. I've been loving it, man. And he just sent it out. Hopefully, it's gonna be on Headliner Music Club pretty soon because he's an exclusive guy for them. But yeah, sent that over to me, and that's definitely the one that I wanted to put in for. This, yeah, just uh, go ahead and forward that to me when you get done. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's all I got for you. Um, we got to get into just my one last thing here, who you want to put on a platform. So any person, a brand that you're loving, could be a restaurant, anyone that you want to just shine a little light on and let the viewers and listeners know a little bit about this person. Let's, uh, let's shine some light on Coach. Okay. Jeremy Todd. Yeah. One of the Nashville OGs who... He's got the like vibe East Nashville on yeah. lockdown. He's he always jokes like he'll see a DJ name list. He's like, text me. He's like, do you know this person? I was like, yeah, it's one of the Broadway guys. I'm a, I'm his bridge between East Nashville and the downtown kids. Yeah, I just had rate rates on this past week's episode, so yeah, they're always Jeremy, together. Jeremy's the king of throwing like the monthly theme parties. Like mm-hmm. he's throwing like old school party back in the day where. A thousand people would show up on a Tuesday. Jesus, at the spot I was a resident at my. We were doing old school party on Tuesday. Line would be from the front door up Twelfth Avenue to Broadway on a fucking Tuesday on a night. Tuesday, yeah. What were like the themes? That was just an old school party. Okay, it was just. He just has or, that good of a following and can promote. Like it I mean, that it literally well. started off as like, you know, maybe fifty people showed up and yeah. maybe a hundred people, and find just one random summer day. It was a thousand people were outside. Jesus, good and for then him. it just it stayed that way for several months, and eventually became a point. It's like Jeremy was like, "All right, we need to dial this back down a little bit. Yeah. We got to figure out a way to not let so many people in. Yeah, or get a much bigger venue. Yeah, one of the two. Skrillex came to town and played in front of twenty people. That'd be awesome. Yeah, but okay. he was like a little ahead of his curve on taste making. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's a good one to have on here. We all just went out and saw them a couple weeks ago at uh, at Rosemary Beauty Queen. Yeah. Something that I I need to get out there a lot more to just spots. That's my favorite bar to go to when I'm off. Yeah. I know you've told me that so many times. I've been there just a couple times. Um, but, yeah, I need to get out there more when I have nights off and go check out Coach and go listen to Rate and just some of these other guys yeah. outside of Broadway. So that's a good one to have on here, and we'll uh, – We'll add them to the list. Of yeah, the, it's kind of weird how Nashville is kind of divided up. It is. It's just different like neighborhoods. I mean, Milwaukee is like that too, where it's like three different sections oh, really? of the city. Yeah. Where you have like downtown Brady Street and then you have like Milwaukee Street where the clubs are. So yeah. it's like three different vibes within the city. It's kind of the same kind of thing that I see here in Nashville where it's like Midtown, Germantown, East Nashville, downtown. Yeah. Um, and you get different vibes at, at each of them too. So. But yeah, man, thank you for taking the time to come here. Man, thanks for down. having me. Yeah. You didn't thanks have for, anybody uh, Luna uh, joining us. Yes. Oh. Second half of the episode. And yeah. of course, right when you say that, she just snuggles in with you. <laughs> uh, this time, you didn't have anybody screaming over you, talking over no. you the whole episode. You actually got what a to treat. tell your stories <laughs> and have the people learn a little bit more about you. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for jumping on here. You guys can all follow Rod. I'll get all of his socials in the description here. If you guys aren't already, make sure you're following the platform mix. We got new mixes out every Monday. These episodes come out every Wednesday. I'm DJ Dex. As always, we'll see you guys every Wednesday. See you guys next time. Thank you. See you. Check. Mic check. One, two. Yo, is this thing on or what?